Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. During the previous discussion, we have solved the quantum harmonic oscillator problem. In other words, we have found the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian of the particle of a single particle which moves in a harmonic potential. Now this is as I have mentioned connected very deeply to vibrational spectroscopy. So what is the connection? We will show now that the harmonic oscillator problem that is the, uh, the single particle moving in a harmonic potential corresponds exactly to the vibration of a diatomic molecule. We will see that even for a polyatomic molecule the harmonic oscillator model is absolutely relevant and the vibration of a polyatomic molecule can be written as a sum of harmonic oscillator Hamiltonians where there are n internal degrees of freedom. Let us start with a diatomic molecule and we will later look at polyatomic systems. The picture of a single mass moving in a harmonic potential looks something like this which we have discussed before. There is a mass m connected by a spring to a rigid wall and this moves on a frictionless floor. Now a diatomic molecule does not quite look like this. In fact, a diatomic molecule looks like this where you have two masses m1 and m2 and these are connected by a spring like this. And these two particles move according to the force due to the spring and we assume that there is no other forces acting on this two particles. Now our goal is to show that this system of two particles attached by a spring is actually identical to the system of one particle attached by a spring and another problem of an overall translation of center of mass. So let us look into this precisely and we will map this problem of two particles attached by a spring to a harmonic oscillator problem. So let us assume that these two masses have positions x1 and x2 for masses m1 and m2. Now we can define a relative coordinate x which is x2 minus x1 which is the difference in the position of the two coordinates. This relative coordinate is a measure of how much the spring is stretched or compressed and therefore tells us how much force is acting on the two masses. For this system there is also another important coordinate which is the center of mass coordinate and by definition the center of mass coordinate here is m1 x1 plus m2 x2 divided by m1 plus m2. So this is the center of mass coordinate. Our goal is to write the Hamiltonian of this two mass problem in terms of these new coordinates which are the relative coordinates and the center of mass coordinates. So let us see how we can go about doing that. We will express the x1 and x2 coordinate in terms of the relative coordinate and the center of mass coordinate. So let us call this as equation 1 and this as equation 2. So let us let me begin with equation 2 and I will rearrange this as m1 x plus m2 x is equal to m1 x1 plus m2 x2 
and I take equation 1 and I multiply by m 1 and write that on the next line and that I then I get m 1 x is equal to m 1 x 2 minus m 1 x 1. Now, if I add these two equations, then you see that these two terms will cancel and I get m 1 x plus m 2 x capital X plus m 1 small x is equal to m 1 plus m 2 times x 2. Now, if I solve for x 2, I get x 2 is equal to capital X plus m 1 x divided by m 1 plus m 2. Here is the equation for x 2 and I will substitute in equation 1 to get now an expression for x 1. So, on substituting I get x is equal to capital X plus m 1 x divided by m 1 plus m 2 minus x 1. So, x 1 is equal to x capital X plus m 1 x divided by m 1 plus m 2 minus small x. Let us simplify these two terms. So, this gives capital X plus m 1 x minus m 1 x minus m 2 x divided by m 1 plus m 2 and these two terms cancel giving an expression for x 1 which is capital X minus m 2 x divided by m 1 plus m 2. So, now in these two boxes we have the expressions for the coordinates of the two masses in terms of the center of mass coordinate and the relative coordinate of the two masses. Let us now consider what the Hamiltonian looks like of this two mass system in terms of these new coordinates. So, let us write the Hamiltonian now and as you know the Hamiltonian has the kinetic energy operator and the potential energy operator. So, let us start with the kinetic energy operator. So, the kinetic energy of the two mass system which I will denote as T, I will first write the classical expression for kinetic energy and then as you know we can convert to the quantum operator by substituting the classical variables with the quantum operator. So, here is the classical kinetic energy which is half m 1 x 1 dot squared plus half m 2 x 2 dot squared. x 1 dot is the first derivative of the position with respect to time. So, it is just the velocity 1 and this x 2 dot is the velocity 2. We have obtained the value of x 1 as capital X minus m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 little x. So, the first derivative with respect to time is equal to capital X dot minus m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 little x dot and similarly we have x 2 is equal to capital X plus m 1 divided by m 1 plus m 2 little x and x 2 dot will be capital X dot plus m 1 divided by m 1 plus m 2 x dot. So, if we substitute the expressions for x 1 dot and x 2 dot into the kinetic energy expression, we get the kinetic energy value is half m 1 
capital X dot minus M2 divided by M1 plus M2 X dot square plus half M2 X dot plus M1 plus divided by M1 plus M2 X dot square. Expanding this out, we get half m 1 x dot squared minus m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 x dot x dot. Here the half outside cancels with the 2 which comes when you open the square and plus half m 1 m 2 squared divided by m 1 plus m 2 x dot squared. These three terms come from the first term in the previous line. We now expand the second term and that gives half m 2 x dot squared plus m 2 m 1 divided by m 1 plus m 2 x dot x little dot plus half m 2 m 1 squared divided by m 1 plus m 2 whole squared x dot squared. In the previous term, this m 1 plus m 2 in the denominator should also be whole squared. This expression can now be simplified further by noting that these two terms actually cancel each other and we can combine now the these two terms here and the last two terms together. So, we can write this as half of m 1 plus m 2 capital X dot squared plus half m 1 m 2 and then we can write this as m 1 plus m 2 X dot squared divided by m 1 plus m 2 whole squared. And one of the terms in the numerator and denominator m 1 plus m 2 cancels and finally, we have this is equal to half m 1 plus m 2 capital X squared plus half m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 small x squared. We can now define a total mass of the system m 1 plus m 2 which is m this is the total mass and we can define another quantity which is for m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 which we will call mu which we will call the reduced mass of the system. And with that the kinetic energy T becomes half capital M x dot squared plus half mu small x dot squared. By using momentum P m is equal to mass times velocity and similarly, small p mu is equal to mu times velocity x dot. We can write the kinetic energy as P m squared by 2 m plus P mu squared by 2 mu. The potential energy in the case of the two mass system connected by a spring depends only on the relative separation between the two masses. So, in other words the potential energy V is a function of the relative coordinate x.
which is equal to x2 minus x1. So, the Hamiltonian which is a sum of the kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to P m squared by 2 m plus P mu squared by 2 mu plus V of x. If we look at the expression for this Hamiltonian, we can observe that this is equivalent to the Hamiltonian of a system of two particles, one of which is a particle of mass m and another which is of mass mu. And the particle of mass capital M particle 1 does not have any potential energy. So, it is moving without any force acting on it and the particle with mass mu has a potential energy V x. So, this is the potential energy associated with mu. So, we see that the system of two particles attached with a spring can be equivalently written as a system of two different particles which are in some sense fictitious. One of these is a particle of mass m1 plus m2 which is the total mass of the system and that is moving without any force that is this part of the Hamiltonian and there is another fictitious particle with a mass mu which is the reduced mass particle 2 has mass mu is equal to m1 plus m2 divided by m1 plus m2 and this is moving with a potential Vx which is which depends only on the relative distance between the two masses m1 and m2. The motion of the center of mass does not have any force acting on it and therefore, it is just a translation with constant motion or the particle or the two masses may just be stationary and the real energy quantization is due to the internal motion of the two particles which is in the second part of the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian of interest for now us is h is equal to p mu squared divided by 2 mu plus v of x. And if we write the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian which is the operator this becomes minus h bar squared by 2 mu d squared by dx squared plus b of x. The question is what is v of x? For this let us look at what the potential energy looks like for a diatomic molecule. For a typical diatomic molecule, the potential energy V of x as a function of the distance between the two atoms looks something like this. So, the x axis here is the distance between the two atoms and you can call this as x the relative coordinate and the value at which the energy is the lowest is also called the equilibrium geometry of the diatomic molecule and we can denote that as x naught. And if we make a Taylor expansion of this potential energy around the equilibrium geometry, so let us Taylor expand around this equilibrium geometry, then V of x is equal to V of x naught plus dV by dx at x is equal to x naught multiplied by x minus x naught plus the second order term 1 over 2 factorial d 2 v by d x squared at x is equal to x naught multiplied by x minus x naught whole squared and then the higher order terms. We notice here that x minus x naught 
is the displacement with respect to the equilibrium geometry and the equilibrium geometry is denoted by x naught in our case. So, at the equilibrium geometry as you can see from the figure the first derivative is equal to 0. So, d v by d x at x is equal to x naught is equal to 0 and therefore, the expansion of the potential energy in terms of a Taylor series which is up to the second order simply becomes v of x is equal to v of x naught which is just the absolute energy at x naught plus half d squared v by d x squared x is equal to x naught which is a constant at the particular value x is equal to x naught and multiplied by x minus x naught squared. And this is good up to the second order which is a fairly good approximation for a potential energy of the form that you see here. So, the potential energy is essentially that of a harmonic oscillator. The Hamiltonian is therefore, that of a particle moving in a harmonic oscillator potential. So, to summarize the Hamiltonian of diatomic molecule which consists of two masses attached by a spring is essentially minus h bar squared by 2 mu d squared by d x squared plus v of x where mu is equal to the reduced mass m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 and v of x is equal to half k x minus x naught squared where x is the relative coordinate which is the difference in the coordinate between x 2 minus x 1 or in other words it is the change in the distance between the two masses and x naught is the distance between the two masses when the spring is not stretched and not compressed or in other words that is the lowest potential energy of the two mass system connected by the spring. So, this is the distance between the two masses when potential energy is the least. We can now understand that the vibration of a diatomic molecule can be modeled by the motion of a single particle moving in a harmonic potential, because we have seen that these two problems are essentially mathematically exactly equivalent. You have to keep in mind that you have to use the reduced mass of the system which is given by m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2. The idea of modeling the vibration of a diatomic molecule by a particle moving in a harmonic potential can be extended to polyatomic molecules as well. And in that case you can see that the vibration can be modeled as a sum of several one dimensional oscillators. There is a point which we need to note here. We have seen that the harmonic oscillator potential energy V of x is equal to half k x squared. Now, here the form that we have is half k x minus x naught squared. The point is that these two potential energies are actually equivalent and we can convert this potential energy v of x which is half k x minus x naught squared to this half k x squared by shifting the origin to x is equal to x naught. So, then the value at x naught just becomes 0 
and we have instead of x minus x naught x minus 0 squared which is basically half k x squared. We have seen the derivation of the eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator and how the harmonic oscillator is a good model for a vibrating diatomic molecule and how it can be a good model for the vibration of a polyatomic molecule. Let us now derive the vibrational selection rule. In a previous lecture, it has been discussed that the dipole moment of a molecule depends on the geometry of the molecule and let us focus on a diatomic molecule where there is only one geometrical coordinate which is the distance between the two atoms which we denote as x and then this dipole moment can be written as a constant plus a derivative d mu by dx first derivative at x is equal to 0 multiplied by x and then there are higher order terms. The intensity of a vibrational transition depends on the square of the transition dipole moment integral which is psi i star mu psi f d tau where psi i is the initial vibrational state, psi f is the final vibrational state and mu is the dipole moment operator and if we expand the dipole moment operator like we have written here and use this in the integral then this becomes psi i star mu 0 psi f d tau plus the second term which is d mu by dx at x is equal to 0 and psi i star x times psi f d tau. Then we notice that this first term is 0 because of orthonormality of the eigenfunctions and the transition dipole moment depends primarily on this term where again there are two terms. The first is this and th this term is the derivative of the dipole moment with respect to the geometry and this first term should be non-zero for this entire term to be non-zero and it implies that the dipole moment gradient should be non-zero. So, with a change in geometry the dipole moment should actually change for this term to be non-zero. This is what is called the gross selection rule and is discussed in a previous lecture and the second part which is here should also be non-zero and the question we ask now is when is this psi i star x psi f d tau when is this non-zero? Because this will give us the specific selection rule which is that the quantum number change between the initial state and the final state is plus or minus 1. Let us go ahead and derive this result. We are looking for the condition when the integral psi i x psi f dx can be non-zero when psi i and psi f are eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. So, for this we recall that we defined these two operators the ladder up operator and the ladder down operator and we write their specific forms which are b dagger is equal to 1 over square root of 2 minus d by dq plus q and b is equal to 1 over square root of 2 d by dq plus q. We further recall that the b dagger operator 
acting on an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator with quantum number n gives an eigenfunction with quantum number n plus 1 and the ladder down operator b operates on the eigenfunction with quantum number n and gives an eigenfunction with quantum number n minus 1. Now, using these definitions of the B dagger and B operator, we can easily write Q as a sum of these operators. So, if we take B dagger plus B, the minus D by DQ cancels with the D by DQ and you get 2 Q divided by square root of 2 or in other words, this is equal to square root of 2 Q and therefore, q is equal to b dagger plus b divided by square root of 2. Further, q is equal to square root of m omega by h bar x. So, x is equal to square root of h bar divided by m omega q or that is equal to square root of h by m omega b dagger plus b divided by square root of 2. The important point is that x can be written as some constant times the sum of the raising and lowering operators. Using this, it is quite easy to derive the specific vibrational selection rule. So, for this, let us substitute in the integral that we are interested in. So, psi i x psi f dx which is what we had here is some constant psi i b dagger plus b divided multiplied by psi f dx that is equal to c times psi i b dagger psi f dx plus c times psi i all of these should be stars b psi f dx. Now, b dagger of psi f gives an eigenfunction with the quantum number increased by 1. So, if psi f had quantum number n, b dagger of psi f increases the quantum number to n plus 1. Now, the only way that this integral would be non-zero is if the quantum number of psi i and b dagger of psi f are the same and that would be possible if psi f has a quantum number 1 less than psi i. So, that when b dagger operates on psi f, it increases the quantum number by 1. So, this implies that the delta, the change in the quantum number which is the quantum number of final minus quantum number of initial should be minus 1. Similarly, if we consider this second integral, then the B operator acting on psi f decreases the quantum number by 1. So, if the quantum number of psi f was n, then B operating on psi f gives the quantum number n minus 1 and this integral would be non-zero if the quantum number of psi f to begin with was 1 greater than psi i. So, after b operates on psi f, the quantum number would decrease by 1 and make it equivalent to psi i and then the integral would be non-zero. This gives delta n is equal to n f minus n i is equal to plus 1 and that is the origin of the specific selection rule that for a vibrational transition to occur delta n should be plus or minus 1. If the quantum number of psi f is more than 1 unit greater than psi i, then the B operator operating on it cannot lower it to make it equivalent to the psi i and therefore, the integral will be 0 and no transition will occur. So, we have seen that the specific selection rule delta n is equal to plus or minus 1 
can be derived quite easily using the ladder up and ladder down operators which were used in the derivation of the eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian.